All right. Well, it's great to see you. If you're new this morning, want to say welcome. We pray that you just feel the warm embrace of God and also us. So we're glad you're here. Thanks for taking a or taking a Sunday to check us out. And uh, this morning, we're actually going to keep moving through our Gospel of Mark series. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn or turn with me to Mark chapter three. We're going to be in verse seven through nineteen today. And over the last several weeks in the series, we've journeyed through a string of passages that uh, scholars call the controversy dialogues. Okay, and they call it that because. Uh, the last several passages we've looked at are times where the religious authorities are challenging Jesus and challenging his authority. And with each controversy, the tension between Jesus and these authorities grow as Jesus continues to reveal something about who he is and what he came to do. And in the controversies, they climaxed last week in verse 6 of chapter 3. I want to throw it up on the screen quick. It says this. It says, The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Okay, so this is interesting. Uh, The Pharisees, who were the religious leaders of the day, decided to conspire with the Roman authorities, the Herodians, to kill Jesus. And Jewish people did not like the Romans. Uh, So for them to come together with the Romans to say, or to say, we want to kill Jesus, is a big deal. And Jesus, he knows that his time is going to be short, as he knows what was going on. He knows the conspiring that was happening behind the scenes. And, and Jesus decides to make a revolutionary move in our passage today by going and selecting his 12 disciples. He's gathering an army so that he can train them to go and take the gospel, take the good news to the ends of the earth, even after his death. So let's read it. It's in verse 7. It says this. It says, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed him from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem, and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him, and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. And he went up on the mountain and called to him, or those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he also gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges, which is a cool name, and that is Sons of Thunder. I want to be a Son of Thunder. Come on, somebody. All right, let's keep moving. Andrew and Philip and, and Bartholomew and Matthew and Thomas and James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus and Simon the Zealot and the one we all hate, Judas Iscariot. I'm kidding. We don't hate anybody who betrayed him. All right, so the sermon titled this morning is this, Restoration and Revolution. All right, I'm going to pray as you write that down. So Jesus, this morning we come into your presence and we ask you to speak to us as we take a look at this passage. I pray that it would kind of jump off the page and into our hearts. And Spirit of God, we pray that you would just speak to us. We pray that this would not be lofty words of wisdom, that it wouldn't just be my ideas, but it would be a demonstration of your power. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, somebody. It's going to be a good day in God's house. I'm excited. Okay, so seven years ago this week, I received a phone call from the state director of Chi Alpha in Iowa, and he asked me to return to lead, or to return to Cedar Falls to lead Chi Alpha at UNI. I was so excited. I had been a student at UNI. I had been a part of Chi Alpha back a, a few years before that. And I had been praying for a couple of years that God would call a new person to lead Chi Alpha as there wasn't a director for a couple of years. And I got the opportunity to be the answer to my own prayers. You can read my journals from 2011, 2012, uh, that time. And I was praying that God would send somebody. And then I got to be the answer to my own prayers. It was amazing. After praying about it for only one evening, Emily and I decided to say yes. We knew that God was calling us to return to Cedar Falls and to lead Chi Alpha. And as I prepared to return to Cedar Falls, I started praying that God would bring in some key freshmen that could help us get Chi Alpha off on the right foot. And just as Jesus prayed for his 12, I was praying for a handful of students. It didn't have to be a lot, but a handful of students who we could build the ministry around. And the Lord answered that prayer. And he ended up 
bringing in some really amazing freshmen that are still a part of our church today. It's amazing. Uh, six years later, they're part of our church. I think of Marcus and Katie Boldy. Katie Boldy's on staff with us. She came in as a freshman. I freaked her out because I called her Catherine because that's what her Facebook name was. But uh, that's an inside joke that was dumb to share. But anyways, and also Regan Shaw came in. He's part of our church. But there was another student named John Griffin, and he's also still a part of our church, and he works with Chi Alpha. And I've known John for most of my life as he grew up in school with my brother, Derek. So my brother's the guy who plays guitar over here and leads our worship team. So he grew up with Derek. So I knew John for most of my life. And, and, uh, and when I heard he was coming to you and I, I made sure to go and invite him to Chi Alpha. And through a series of events, he ended up coming to our first Chi Alpha service, and he actually gave his life to the Lord during that service. However, if I'm honest, his journey with Jesus was not just like this straight line upwards. It wasn't like he responded to the gospel and then he was just, you know, looking just like Jesus the next day, right? That doesn't happen for any of us. But, but for him, he would often go weeks without, you know, coming to Chi Alpha. We wouldn't see him for some time. And he just wasn't quite all in with Jesus and community yet. And when the second semester started, I was beginning to think about the next school year. And something that's big for Chi Alpha, and actually big for our church too, is the idea of raising up small group leaders. And because we're such a young ministry, we didn't have a lot of people to choose from. So I'm like, okay, we got a few people who could maybe be small group leaders. John only comes to Chi Alpha once a month, but hey, he's a nice guy, and he's likable, and he kind of loves Jesus. So I'm going to meet with him. So I, I met with John, and I told him that I could see him becoming a small group leader on the campus. I could see him leading his friends to Jesus. And then I said something along the lines of this. I said, John, in order for this to happen, the Lord needs you to step up. He needs you to start taking seriously the call to be his disciple. You can't help others follow him if you're not actually following him yourself. And that means you need to be here every week. It means you need to be teachable. You need to be hungry. You need to want to grow. And it means that you need to read your Bible and pray. I need you to step up. I need you to truly live your faith out. And that's all it took. There was like fire in his eyes. Like, like the vision of being a true disciple of Jesus and leading his friends to Jesus just captivated his heart. And he's never looked back. For the last several years, he has committed to stepping up and leading his friends to Jesus. And now he's a full-time minister on the campus, and he's led literally several, if not dozens, of guys to Jesus or in their discipleship to Jesus. John has made a huge impact on the campus. Yeah, come on. John's probably here. I don't know where he's at. He's somewhere in here. There he is, back there hiding in the video booth. But uh, yeah, he's doing our live stream. So live stream, if it's not good, you blame John, okay? I'm, I'm just kidding. All right, so John's story illustrates an important principle. Every Christian must have a moment where they go from just receiving salvation to actually becoming a disciple of Jesus who, who truly follows Jesus. A few weeks ago, we talked about this trend in the American church right now called, I call it relevance Ism. That's not a word, but that's what I call it. And, and, and this idea of relevantism, it, it has swept the American church over the last few decades. And, and the basic idea is if we can make Jesus more palatable and the church more cool to the culture, then we can reach the culture. That's the idea behind this trend. And the heart behind this, I think, was very good. It comes from the desire to see more people say yes to Jesus. It comes from this desire to not have people turn away from Jesus because the church is weird and just, you know, needlessly confrontational. It comes from that Heart. It comes from a desire to, or to remove barriers to faith in Jesus and to see more people receive salvation. But the problem with this is, is we've been more focused on getting more people into our churches than getting Jesus into people. Okay, we've been more focused on getting people to like our churches and come to our churches on Sundays than actually getting Jesus into people. We've been more focused on building big churches than building big people. And because of this, we've had bigger churches. Actually, mega churches have grown like crazy across the country, but we've had smaller people. And focusing on just getting people to say yes to Jesus, we failed at the messy work of actually teaching people to follow Jesus and live like him. And this is having grave consequences on the American church. We've seen this clearly, very vividly, in the last couple of years, as many have walked away from the church during this pandemic and shown no signs of coming back. In our obsession with getting more people into our churches, we failed to give them the, or the tools to follow Jesus and go the distance in their faith, even when it's hard. Hear me, I'm not against getting more people into our churches. I pray that our church would grow like crazy. I'm already thinking, what happens when we fill up two services? What do we do? I don't really want to do three services. I pray we have to at some point. You know, what happens when we fill up three services? We build a bigger building. I don't know. I, I, or I dream these dreams. I pray these prayers. I want to reach more people. I pray that our church would grow every single week. However, we can't let that be our primary focus. 
if we focus on building a big church, we might not actually get disciples. If we focus on building a big church, we might not actually get disciples. But if we focus on building disciples, we'll probably have a bigger church because disciples go and reach other people. Big people first, big church second. Uh, not the other way around, which is how we try to do it sometimes. And Barna, which is a Christian, or a Christian research group, did a study in 2020 called the State of the Church, and they found some alarming trends. They found that the percentage of practicing Christians has dropped in half since 2000. Okay, there are people, or these are people who call themselves Christians, people who prioritize their faith and regularly attend church. So in 2000, 45% of American or 45% of Americans were practicing Christians, and in 2020, that number dropped all the way to 25%, just a downward trajectory. And more specifically, 36% fewer Christians attend, or fewer Americans attend church weekly today than they did in 1993. We are seeing a great slide in people who identify as Christian and are involved in the church. And what's interesting, though, this is interesting, the amount of people who are seriously committed to Jesus has not declined. Okay, so for example, the same amount of people read their Bibles at least several times a day now as they did in 1993. At the same time, the amount of people who never read the Bible is rising dramatically. So what's disappearing is the people in the middle who just read their Bible once in a while. In other words, the amount of committed Christians is staying steady while the amount of non-religious people is rising dramatically, so we're, so we're losing the mushy middle. And we're losing people who say they are a Christian but don't actually live it out. These are people who have said yes to Jesus for salvation or said yes to becoming a part of a church but haven't said yes to Jesus in discipleship. And this, and this suggests that the decline of practicing Christians is coming from those who were only marginally attached to their faith in the first place. Okay, so if you're here this morning and you identify as a Christian but you haven't actually taken up the call of discipleship, so kind of where John was hanging out in that first semester, then chances are you're not going to still identify as a Christian 20 years from now. There are a number of reasons that we're losing the marginally committed. There's a number of reasons, but one that comes to mind is the relationship of the church to the culture has changed. A generation ago, the church was viewed as the standard bearer for, for morality and as a trusted place to get your values. Being a part of the church was considered a virtue in the culture, and church attendance was generally viewed as a good thing. But today, the new standard bearer for, or for morality is increasingly viewed as the cultural elite, such as Hollywood and the news media, the universities, and even corporations now. They tell us what to do and what to believe, don't they? Or they're going to boycott us or not sell our stuff. The culture doesn't look to the church as much to tell us what is right and wrong. Instead, they look to the secular elites. In fact, the church is increasingly viewed as an enemy to the morals and values of our culture. And this is obviously more true in some parts of the country than others. We're in a part of the country that that is not as much the case, but it's definitely the case on the coast, and it's becoming more the case here. In general, if you get out of step with the morals and values of these elites, the call, the same call as Christianity, but you know, in a different way, the call is to repent and receive salvation enlightenment, right? Receive enlightenment. Think like we think. Believe what we believe. That's the call. I share that to say that there is an increasing cost to being religious in this generation. Your generation. Church involvement is not going to give you the benefits it once did. And you're not going to be viewed as more virtuous or more, or more moral because you're a part of a church anymore. The only reason you'll choose to be a part of a church is if you actually love Jesus. That's the only reason. It's not a benefit anymore to be part of a church. It's becoming less and less of a benefit. You actually have to love Jesus and follow him to want to show up here every Sunday. That's becoming more and more the case. Obviously not with everybody. But this morning I want to make a hypothesis, and it's this. The future of the church, the future of the church is the ancient path of discipleship. If you don't know what that means, discipleship is the process of becoming like Jesus. And the data tells us that if we want to still be with Jesus and his church 20 years from now and want to help other people do the same, we must rediscover the art of discipleship. The days of being able to increase church attendance without actually teaching people how to follow Jesus are over. Okay, we see the importance of discipleship in our passage this morning. After Mark tells us that the authorities are conspiring to kill Jesus, 
Jesus tries to withdraw with his disciples to the sea, but a great crowd follows him. They were flocking to Jesus because word had gotten out that he could heal. In a world where, where medical skill was limited, someone who could heal anybody and everybody caused quite a stir. In these days, there wasn't social media. I don't know if you knew that. In the first century, no social media. There was no newspapers. There was no news. So this was all word of mouth. People are like, Jesus is doing some crazy stuff. He's given healing. Get to him. Find him. He's amazing. Okay, so this little town in Galilee was being flooded with people from all over the place. But Jesus, he wasn't only healing people physically. He was also dealing with demonic forces that were oppressing the people. He was pushing back spiritual darkness. The people were so desperate just to touch Jesus. They were so desperate to touch him because they knew that he had the keys to restoration. And the crowd, it gets so large that Jesus gets worried that he's going to be crushed. It reminds me of like the concerts when everyone's like smashing against each other. You're like, I want out of here, right? He tells his disciples to get a boat ready so he can go out to sea and get away from the crowd. And by seeking to restore people, Jesus was actually making life more difficult for himself as he could not get alone. And the authorities were growing increasingly frustrated with him. And this shows us the important truth that Jesus loves to heal. Jesus loves to set people free. Bringing restoration is the passion of Jesus, even when it cost him something. It would eventually cost him his life, right, on the cross. Jesus loves to bring restoration. And Matthew alludes to this in his gospel. In Matthew 9, it says this, And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. And get this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Why? Because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, so when Jesus sees crowds, when he sees people in pain, he doesn't get frustrated. He's not like you and me. He doesn't get frustrated. He doesn't get annoyed. Instead, his compassion stirs within him. He doesn't say, oh, if you would only do this and that and that, you wouldn't have all these difficulties in your life. No, his compassion, it stirs within him. The Old Testament book, Hosea, illustrates this well. It says this about God's heart towards those who rebel against them. It says this in Hosea 11, verse 8. It says, my heart recoils within me, recoils within me, and my compassion grows warm and tender. The heart of Jesus burns for the lost. His heart burns for the hurting. It hurts for the sinner. It hurts for the sufferer. He loves people who don't actually love him back. Do you realize that a lot of these people in the cross, they didn't really want Jesus. They just wanted his healing. Sounds like some of us, right? You're like, oh, come on, that's too real. Jesus, he even ends up, can we go back to that? If you're here this morning, and all you want from Jesus is healing, but you don't actually want Jesus, I want to encourage you that the healing that you really want, the deep spiritual healing you really want, is going to come when you give your life to him completely. But that's the back half of the sermon, so i got to back up for a second. All right, so, man, come on, that is good stuff this morning. Don't be like the crowd that says, oh, please just make this temporary thing better, but I don't actually want to change eternally. But even though we're like that, his, his heart still stirs for us. His compassion still stirs for us. He even ends up sacrificing his life for those people. He ends up sacrificing his life for those who deny him and betray him. He knows every bad thing you've ever done. He knows every bad thing you'll ever do, and yet he still died for you. He died for me. That messes with me. And when he's on the cross, what does he say? He says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In other words, they are like sheep without a shepherd. They don't know their right hand from their left. His heart burns for the lost. He loves his enemies. He loves the down and out. He loves the one who is lost. His heart recoils within him. When Jesus sees people who are lost like sheep without a shepherd, his compassion bubbles up. And this means this morning that Jesus' love and compassion is stirred for you. It's stirred for you. Do you believe that? Do you actually believe that, that Jesus loves you even at your worst? When he sees you in your sin and your pain, he loves you. He came and he died on a cross so that he could make your restoration possible. And with that said, the first point this morning is if you want restoration, come to Jesus. If you want restoration, come to Jesus. Come on. If you want restoration, come to Jesus. Jesus is not waiting for you to figure, or to figure your life out. He's not waiting for you to clean it up a little bit, go to church a little bit more. 
He's not waiting for you to have it all together, to be more religious. He is standing at the door of your heart, and he's asking you to invite him in. He wants to, or to be let into every area so that you can experience his restoration in the warm embrace of his Father. All you got to do is come to him. In Matthew 11, he said this. He says, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For what? My yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy, my burden is light. You must know that Jesus, he doesn't promise to make everything perfect in your life. That's not why you come to him. He's not gonna make everything perfect. You're gonna go through stuff. But he does promise to carry your burdens. He does promise to be with you in the midst of the fire. He promises to give you rest even when you shouldn't have any rest at all. He promises to save and redeem those who put their trust in him. If you're here this morning and you need some restoration, all you got to do is call upon the name of Jesus. He will hear your cry. If you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. James, the apostle, tells us that in his letter. Do you need to draw near to Jesus today and experience that restoration? If you do, I pray that you would. With that said, Jesus doesn't only call us to come to him, though. He doesn't only call us to be restored. It doesn't stop at a prayer prayed or a prayer for salvation or a healing. It doesn't stop there. He calls us to join his army of light and become like him so we can go out and help other people be restored. And we see this clearly through the next step that Jesus takes. It says this in verse 13. It says, He went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12 whom he also named apostles so that they might be with him, and he might send them out to preach and cast out demons. Come on. And cast out demons. I love that. After ministering to the crowds and healing people both physically and spiritually, Jesus makes a bold, decisive move towards not just touching a few lives, but to renewing the entire world. He says, I don't want to just touch a few lives in the crowd. I want to see the whole world renewed, and this is how I'm going to do it. First, I'm going to go up on a mountain. So he goes up on a mountain. Mark tells us that. He tells us that specifically because Mark is trying to say that whatever is about to happen is very significant. The key points in Jesus' ministry uh, throughout the Gospel of Mark, they happen on a mountaintop. They're key junctures, they're key, or they're key moments. And, and renowned New Testament scholar N.T. Wright takes it further. He says that in Jesus' day, the mountains were a place where you would go to plot a revolution. It's a place you would go away from the authorities to plot a revolution. Jesus goes up onto the mountain and he stokes the fires of revolution by forming an army of 12 men who he will train to bring his gospel to the ends of the earth. And the number 12 is very significant. The number 12 is the same number of tribes that Israel had in the Old Testament. And these ancient tribes had been exiled throughout foreign lands. And the prophets throughout the Old Testament, they speak of a coming restoration when God would make them a great nation once again. Jesus is saying that his ministry is the restoration that Israel and the world has been waiting for. In Mark, he tells us that Jesus appointed the 12. That word appointed is important. It's the same word that Moses uses in Genesis 1-1 when he says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The the word for created or made is the same word as appointed. Okay, so Mark, he seems to be trying to tell us that this event is on par with the creation of the world. Just as God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1, Jesus is is igniting a new creation project through appointing these 12 men. Jesus is beginning a a revolution of light that will ripple to the ends of the earth. It's interesting to think that Jesus begins this revolution by choosing 12 people to follow him. He surely could have just continued doing miracles, preaching the gospel, letting the crowds and the demons find out that he's God as the demons were trying to tell people he's the son of God, he's the son of God, which means they're trying to get the authorities to kill him, right? They're like, hey, It's him, but Jesus is trying to hide that, right? But he could have just did that. He could have just told everyone he's God. He could have did miracles and and signs and wonders, but and he did do some of that, but he had a better plan than just that. He was going to train a community of apostles. Okay, so what does apostle mean? It means sent ones. I like the word sent. Okay, sent one. I don't know if you know that. So Jesus, he knew that if he was going to reach the world and have a long-term impact, he needed to raise up an army of sent ones. Mm, who could carry his mission forward even after his death and resurrection. 
Okay, so while Jesus, he came to inaugurate his kingdom and make salvation possible through his death and resurrection, it was the job of the sent ones to carry the torch of the Jesus revolution to the ends of the earth. Earlier, we looked at part of Matthew 9, where it says that Jesus had compassion on the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, the next two verses say this in verse 37 through 38. It says, Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. Okay, so while Jesus, he certainly had compassion on the crowds. He brought restoration to them. He knew that if he was going to spark a worldwide, or a worldwide revolution and have a long-term impact, he needed people who followed him no matter what, who could teach other people to follow him. He needed laborers. He knew that before he could bring revolution to the world, he needed to bring revolution to a few. The idea was that it would have a, a ripple effect outwards as people are changed to help other people change, to help other people change, to help other people change. And the same applies to us today. If we want to bring revolution to the world around us, we need to actually follow Jesus and experience revolution ourselves. If we want to be a church that is truly for the one, for the city and for the world, and brings restoration to the lost and hurting in the Cedar Valley and beyond, we need to actually follow Jesus ourselves. We need to be the real deal. I'm not interested in us just saying, hey, we're going to take Jesus but still do our own thing. No, we need to be the real deal. Sent Church, we are a place where we want to be the real deal. That's what our heart is. We're not perfect at it, but that's our heart. Okay, so with that said, if you want revolution, follow Jesus. If you want revolution, follow Jesus. But the question remains, what does it look like to follow him? How do we get trained up to become this laborer? Well, I think there's three primary reasons, or, or, or they're not reasons, pieces to that. Okay, so verses 14 and 15, it says, and he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that, two things, or so that they might be with them, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. Okay, so the first thing, it, it, if you want to follow Jesus, you've got to be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. You've got to be with Jesus. Okay, the primary job of the 12 was to follow the rabbi, because Jesus was a rabbi, follow the rabbi around and just be with him. Jesus didn't simply want minions who did his bidding. He wanted friends. He wanted co-workers. Do you know that you can be a co-worker of Jesus? You can be a friend of Jesus. Jesus wanted fellowship with them. He wanted to be with his disciples. He wanted to do life with them. He knew that if he could be with them, they would become like him and they would change the world. He knew that. So with that said, the second thing he wanted, the second piece of discipleship is to become like Jesus. Okay, become like Jesus. This isn't explicitly stated in the text, but the purpose of en engaging in discipleship is to become like your rabbi. That's the whole purpose of it. That's what discipleship is. It's becoming like the one who you call teacher. And by calling these disciples to follow him, Jesus was going, or Jesus was asking them to engage in the process of dying to their old selves and becoming more like him. He was, he was inviting them on that journey. To say yes to following him was to say yes to becoming like him. And his hope is that he would raise up people who look just like him. He wanted little Jesus is running around. That was his heart. He wanted them to take on his characteristics and carry his message forward. If you want to know how to engage in this process yourself. We actually preached on this a few weeks ago in Vision 2021 series in the sermon, Becoming Like Our Teacher. I'd encourage you to go back and listen. There's a whole framework we kind of developed on how we can become like Jesus. Okay, but the third thing is be sent by Jesus. Okay, that's the third thing we need to do if we want to engage in discipleship. We have to be sent by Jesus. We have to go and actually do what Jesus did. Okay, we can't just say, I'm going to hang out with Jesus. I'm going to try to become more holy myself. I'm not going to tell anyone else about him. I'm not going to do anything. No, you have to actually go and be sent by Jesus. You have to do the things he did. Okay, the text tells us that the 12 were sent by Jesus to preach and to cast out demons. And that job of being a sent one, it's already in their title of apostle. It's right there in the title. They are sent ones by name. The call is to lead others to experience restoration. The call is to lead others into discipleship. They were called to bring physical emotional and spiritual restoration just as Jesus did that for them. 
If we want to be a part of a Jesus revolution in our day, both in our own lives and in the world around us, we need to follow this path of simply being with Jesus, becoming like Jesus, and being sent by Jesus. Okay, so, so when I think about this process of discipleship and its, and its revolutionary impact, I can't help but think of Forrest Estrom. Okay, I don't think he's here in this service. He'll probably be in the next one, hopefully. If he's not, I'll have to text him. No, I'm kidding. But, <laughs> but at the beginning of the fall semester of 2018, I met Forrest. He was coming in. He was a freshman on the campus at UNI. And I got to watch him give his life to Jesus during our first Chi Alpha service and, and then later get baptized in the Holy Spirit at the Chi Alpha Fall Retreat. And my brother Derek, he met with him every week and, and tried to help Forrest grow in his discipleship to Jesus. And over winter break, Forrest went back home and shared Jesus with Noah Rukti, who actually gave announcements today. Our friend Noah, where's he at? You raise your hand, are you in here? There he is, back there. You know, the nicest guy in the world. Seriously, one of the best people I know, Noah Rukti, come on. Amazing guy. All right, so he went and shared Jesus with Noah. Noah didn't know Jesus, didn't grow up in a Christian home. And through his bold witnessing, Noah gave his life to Jesus. I actually met Noah for the first time at a winter conference in the baptismal pool. I'm like, hey, bro, I don't know you. Dunk. It was fun. <laughs> but uh, and over the following months, Forrest encouraged and helped Noah in his discipleship to Jesus. And in 2019, Noah transferred to Hawkeye partially, I think mainly, so he could be a part of Chi Alpha up here. He moved up here so he could be part of Chi Alpha. And, and he grew in the Lord all throughout that year. It's actually John Griffin, the one I talked about at the beginning of the sermon. He met with him every single week. And now Noah is training to be a minister. He's an intern in Chi Alpha, and he's actively helping other guys in their discipleship to Jesus. He's raised up many guys in Jesus. In this story, it would not have happened if it had not been for discipleship. I'm telling you, discipleship works. And discipleship bears fruit that actually lasts and makes an impact. Right? It's not just about me preaching and people saying, okay, I believe in Jesus, and then nobody does anything. No, we're raising up an army of people who go out and reach their friends, who go reach their friends, who go reach their friends, and it ripples to the ends of the earth. Think about that. That big moment on the mountain, it started there, and now we're here in Cedar Falls, Iowa, talking about Jesus 2,000 years later. Discipleship works. If our only concern was with getting John to just pray that prayer of salvation in the first Calpha service, then he never could have poured into Noah. If our heart for Forrest was just to get him to come to Calpha, he would not have been equipped to go and share Jesus with Noah back home. If we stopped pushing Noah after his baptism, he never would have been able to help other guys grow in their discipleship, or discipleship to Jesus, and he never would have discerned his call to ministry. If we didn't take seriously the call to discipleship, this story would not have played out the same way. Discipleship is what led to transformation in all three of their lives and literally dozens of more guys on the campus of UNI. With that in mind, where are you at in your journey with Jesus? Jesus, he wants to bring you restoration and he wants to bring you revolution. He wants to touch your life and train you to touch other people's lives. So maybe you're here this morning or you're watching online and you desperately need that restorative power of Jesus today. You need Jesus to maybe restore your body or restore a relationship or your finances or your mental health. Or maybe you need to come into a right relationship with Jesus for the very first time or recommit yourself. Know this, restoration is a part of Jesus' very heart. It's a part of his heart. It's not like he begrudgingly says, okay, I'll touch your life. No, Jesus wants to bring it to you, even at great cost to himself. All you must do is come to Jesus. That's all you got to do. He doesn't say clean it up. He says, come. And again, this does not mean everything will go your way. Following Jesus is actually pretty hard at times. But that does mean if you invite Jesus into every area of your life, he will bring you supernatural, incorruptible peace Enjoy. Or maybe you're here this morning, you're watching online, and you need to respond to Jesus' call to truly follow him and be his disciple. You need to ascend the mountain where Jesus is to be with him, become like him, and be sent by him. You need to let the way of Jesus take root in your heart and encompass every area of your life. The only thing that's gonna prevent you from stepping into this is if you choose to stay at the bottom of the mountain. Jesus is calling you up today. He's calling you higher 
He's calling you to commit to a lifestyle of discipleship. Don't go half in, half out. Go all in. He's calling you to utterly surrender and obey him in every single area of your life so that his work, so that he can work through you and he can actually use you to make a difference and to reach the world. If you answer that call, this is what's amazing about it. If you answer that call, you will be an answer to Jesus' prayer in Matthew 9. You can be an answer to Jesus' prayer. So the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest field. We got a lot of Christians, but few laborers in our generation. We need some laborers. We need some workers. If you answer this call, he will activate you into the harvest field to help your friends become fully devoted followers of Jesus. And we may just see a Jesus revolution in our day. We may see one. So with that said, the main idea this morning is this. If you want restoration, come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. Come to Jesus. You need to do that first, right? And continue to come to him. But if you want, to, or if you want revolution, follow Jesus. If you want revolution, follow Jesus. I've been praying a lot about the future of our church. You know, we've had an amazing last year. It was actually a year ago from yesterday, or yesterday, that we met in this building for the first time. It looked very different, right? And we're praying. We're just doing a worship service. We're just praying that God would give us the building. Now here we are. It's a completely different space. God's done amazing things in the last year. We've had, I think, 45 people get baptized in water. It's been an amazing first year. And I've been praying a lot about the second year and beyond, right? I'm thinking about these things. And I just believe that Jesus is going to take us into even greater things in our second year as a church. I believe we're just scratching the surface of what he wants to do. I just believe that. And Pastor Katie, she preached a couple weeks ago about how Jesus wants to do a new thing. And I just believe that's what his heart is for us. He's, he's calling us into something new, both corporately as a church, but also personally in your life. I believe he's calling us into personally experiencing his, his restoration and his revolution, but then also helping other people experience that. I believe in this next year that Jesus is going to bring more and more people into our church, into his kingdom. Again, not because we want to be a big church, but because we want to disciple people. I just believe he's going to do that. I just see it. I see this vision of us not being able to contain uh, what God's doing here. I believe it's going to happen as we're activated in his mission and we take seriously this call to discipleship. I believe this is going to happen. But again, for this to happen, we have to actually let Jesus get a hold of us. You realize the very first church was smaller than our church, right? It was smaller than our church. It was 120 people, that very first church. And they prayed, they sought God, and God baptized them in the Holy Spirit. He filled them with the Holy Spirit, gave them boldness, and they took the gospel to the ends of the earth in the midst of the hostile Roman authorities and culture of their day, much worse culture than ours. They took it forward, but it's because they actually followed Jesus and were full of his Holy Spirit. If we want to see the same kind of thing happen today, we need to let Jesus do that with us. We need to be with Jesus. We need to become like Jesus, and we need to be sent by Jesus. So the challenge today is to answer that call. Let's be with Jesus every day. Although we can't be in his physical presence, we can carve out time each day to be with him through Bible reading, prayer, worship, silence and solitude, Sabbath once a week, as we talked about last week. We can do those things. We can be with Jesus. His presence can be so near to you. We can make a decision that we're going to be defined by the secret place. So the secret place, that's the place where it's just us and God and no one else is looking around. Or nobody else is watching us. It's that place where just us and Jesus. My prayer for our church is we would be defined by the secret place. We'd be defined by wanting to be with Jesus. And we'd be de defined by our passion and our heart for him. I pray that would be our church. We love Jesus. We can make a decision and say, we're going to be with Jesus. Before we ever do anything for Jesus, we're going to be with Jesus. But also, we got to commit to becoming like him. we got to prioritize growing in our knowledge of God's word. we got to prioritize spending time in Christian community and going out and doing the things that Jesus did so he could transform us. we got to prioritize this idea of not being conformed to the patterns of this world, but being transformed by the renewal of our minds. But finally, let's live out our name. Let's be a sent church. Let's truly be a sent church. Just as Jesus had compassion for those who did not know him yet, 
And for those who didn't have a shepherd, let us be a people whose heart burns for the least of these, who, or whose heart hurts for those who don't know Jesus yet. Let's be a people who leverage our entire lives to help other people know Jesus. Let's not waste our lives. Let's not waste our lives. Let's share our faith in the workplace. Let's pray for those in our lives who don't know Jesus yet. Let's be a sent people. Let's lay down our lives for the hope or for, let's lay down our lives for the world. Let's do that. Let's be those people who say, we're gonna do whatever it takes. If we only reach one more, we're gonna do whatever it takes. Say, we're gonna be those people. We're not gonna wait for someone else to step up. We're going to step up. Let's take seriously our call to discipleship this morning. And here's the beautiful thing. When you take seriously the call to be with Jesus, become like Jesus and be sent by him, that's the best life you could ever live. There's nothing better. What people promise you, what people promise you in this world, it, it, it never measures up to what you think it's going to be. But when Jesus says, come to me, or when he says, I came that you may have life and have it to the full, he meant it. When you take up the call to be his disciple, everything changes for the better. I just believe that. Okay, so this morning, let's stand up all across this room. Let's respond to Jesus. Let's respond to him because he is here right now. The Holy Spirit is here. He is speaking to us. He has your number. Do you realize that he brought you to church for a reason today? He has something he's trying to say to you, maybe something you need to surrender this morning. Maybe you need to start being with Jesus. Maybe you drifted from that quiet time with Jesus or you've never done it or maybe you haven't been trying to become like Jesus, or maybe you haven't been being sent by Jesus. All I know is Jesus has something for you today. He's got something for me. He's got something. So let's pray. Let's ask Jesus to speak to us right now. Let's ask him to tell us what we might need to take up in our discipleship to him. All right, so if you bow your heads and close your eyes, I just want to pray. Holy Spirit, we come to you this morning. And God, we pray that just as those first disciples, they prayed and they waited until you filled them with your Holy Spirit, just as they did that, just as they had that passion to actually live it out, God, I pray that we would have that passion to pursue you, become like you, and be sent by you. God, I pray that you would ignite a Jesus revolution in our day. God, we don't want to wait till the next generation does it. We don't want to wait around, but God, we want to step up. So God, I pray for each of us who you're calling higher in this room, I pray that each of us would step up and come up higher. God, I pray that we would lay down our lives for the world. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I got one more way to respond this morning. I would be remiss if I did not give you an opportunity to come to faith in Christ or commit your life to him or recommit your life to him. So if you're here this morning and you walked in here and you did not have a relationship with Jesus or you once said and you walked away, I want to give you a chance to recommit yourself or to commit yourself for the first time. The beautiful thing about Jesus is he did everything on your behalf, right? He, he came, he lived the perfect life. He died on the cross in your place and he rose from the grave. And all you gotta do, Romans 10 tells us, all we gotta do is confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead and we will be saved. So this morning, if you wanna put your trust in Jesus, I wanna give you a chance to do that. So again, if we could have every head bowed and every eye closed, how I'm gonna do that is I'm just gonna count to three. And when I do, if that's you, just step up your hand saying, Jesus, I wanna come into your family. Jesus, I wanna trust in you. So one, two, three, step up all across this room. I see those hands. Is there anyone else in this room? All right, you put your hands down. I'm just gonna pray a simple prayer of repentance and trust in Jesus, and you pray in your heart. Jesus, this morning we come to you for those that wanna put their faith in you for the first time or recommit themselves. God, I pray that you would do a supernatural work in their hearts. God, I pray that, that you would forgive each of us of our sins, that you would help each of us to step in to this new life that you offer us. God, we love you and we thank you for your sacrifice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so now the prayer team's gonna come. We have a prayer team available for you if you need to get prayer. And also, I just wanna say, every week in the last worship show, for the last worship song, these altars are open if you want to come and pray and seek Jesus. We're going to sing one more song and give you some space to respond. 